Well, Rich, I've made my New Year's resolution. It's to not talk about Star Trek. Oh, somebody, do you want to talk about Star Trek? Yes. Damn it! <laughs> my friends, it is a dark time for Star Trek indeed. Despite being the best of the Kelvin trilogy, Star Trek Beyond's low box office returns has essentially put a nail in the coffin of that franchise. Now though, we have official Star Trek in the form of Discovery, a dark, violent, and angry show with moody lighting and mysterious characters. And on the other hand, we have The Orville, a non-licensed Star Trek show from the creator of The Family Guy with bright, even lighting and sets that look like a Holiday Inn conference room. And to put the cherry on top of everything, Quentin Tarantino is currently producing a new violent R-rated Star Trek film called Star Trek Unchained. Fans for the most part are split and probably very confused. We're here to sort it out for you, maybe. Well, Rich, here we are. It's time for the second half of the first season of Star Trek Discovery to air. It's early January, 2018, and life couldn't be better. Sure it could. Where do you start? Where do you start with Star Trek Discovery? Where do you start? We headed the pilot, and I'm gonna say the single biggest misstep Discovery made was that pilot. That pilot did the show no favors. It did not introduce anything. The show is kind of like built around Michael Burnham as the main character, and that show basically sabotages her from the start. And I watched the, you know, the third episode, the, the real pilot of Star Trek Discovery, and why didn't they start there? If, if you left her, her background more vague and mysterious, I could have come to like her before finding out about the horrible mistakes she has made. Because we had to see the battle of the binary stars. Do Star Trek fans give a shit about the Battle of the Binary Stars? Well, that's the thing. I've, I've, I've felt this after watching Star, Star Trek The Last Jedi, or whatever the fuck that movie was called, <laughs> um, where they, they basically took a giant dump on Star Wars fans. There, there is a, a mode of thinking. People like you and I mm -hmm. are, are soon to be obsolete dinosaurs. Yes. We're, we're elderly. Uh, we're, we're, we have one foot in the grave, and we long for a simpler time of Star Trek. Uh, the networks know this, the, the movie, movie companies know this, when it comes to Star Trek and Star Wars. The Last Jedi killed off Luke Skywalker, it took a dump on everything, it made Yoda dance in, in a bikini bottom. <laughs> it did everything to, to tell you that, hey, hey Grandpa, you're, you ain't getting no more Skywalker, Yoda, Darth Vader crap. We're throwing all that in the garbage and we're moving on. And I think that's kind of what Discovery has done. Because y you look at it from the perspective of the Star Trek fans. Yeah. Uh, and as do I. Uh, but I can also see it from a different perspective of, I mean, this is a lot of reiteration of, of what we said before. Of, yeah. of modern day television. Um, and, and we'll get into that. And that is also my problem with the Orville and we're gonna get into that. But first, let's talk quickly about the critical to, to fan disparagement uh -huh. in reviews. Discovery sits at an 82% uh, critical approval and a 56% fan approval. The Orville is basically the polar opposite, 20% uh, critical, 93% Isn't that fan interesting? Rating. It is very interesting, yeah. And why do you think that is, Richard? I don't know. I, I try. I try my best to divorce Discovery from the idea of Star Trek. And to me, Star Trek, it's this, it's this beautiful idea where humanity has prospered and the, you know, the great unknowns of space. And wouldn't it be amazing to go out into space and all of the wonders we could find out there? What's, it, what's there? And Discovery doesn't give a shit about any of that. And it's like, it, Star Trek Discovery does not give a shit about what the heart 
of Star Trek is to me. And I got to imagine most of these reviews aren't reviews from Star Trek fans. The, there's, there's a camp that says, you know, you've got to do something different. And watching Discovery, I'm watching it and I'm like, this is not like Star Trek I've seen before. And part of me says that's refreshing. The other part longs for the simple one and done episodes. Engage. And I think, I think fans are upset because you've dismantled the legacy. I think that they would be happy going in a new direction and doing fresh stuff as long as you retain that legacy. I think that's what I don't get hung up about. Like a fan might complain about like holographic communication in Discovery, and I, I don't give a shit about that. Okay. I, I give a shit about the heart of the idea. It's, Star Trek is about discovering things. It's about exploring the unknown. It's about it's about your imagination because you look up into those stars and you do wonder what's out there. At least I do. I'm not getting that from Discovery. I'm getting a dour war drama, and I'm getting broken people who are wallowing in the fact that they're broken. Uh, if I could make a counterpoint, we did discover what's out there. What's way out there in Star Trek Voyager, and it's a lot of people with, with a couple of bumps on their face. And I'm just saying. Oh yeah. Uh, it's, it, it, it's a lot of rehash, and it's a lot of um, things getting stale. Uh, there, there are a lot of things in, in Voyager that I like, a lot of new ideas. Uh, let's say that, new ideas. Okay. Storylines. And that's my problem with the Orville. I love the Orville so much that I can't watch it. <laughs> I, the, uh, the Orville, it's not perfect. It's not perfect, but it gives me the warm, happy feels. If I, if I, here's the major difference between each show, okay? I watch Star Trek Discovery and I feel worse. I feel worse about myself. I feel worse about where I am in life. I watch the Orville and it's like, ah, oh, that was fun. It was, it's kind of like diet fun. It's like the Orville, they, they, they want to desperately be Star Trek, but there's something missing. Uh, one, it feels like Seth MacFarlane playing TNG. That's exactly who, what it is. Who doesn't want to play TNG? Uh, you're rich enough, you have enough influence, you have the money. I, I want, I'm Seth MacFarlane, I've had successful television shows. I want to play TNG. But you're Seth MacFarlane, you gotta have some dick jokes. Okay, I'll say a dick joke. I've watched five episodes of, of The Orville. I can't watch anymore. <laughs> because I watch it, first of all, my brain goes haywire. Cause, cause, cause right, in, right in between these years is the Star Trek Encyclopedia. Uh -huh. And I'm going, they lifted that from this. They lifted that from this. They lifted that from this. And, I, and I, my brain starts like, like short circuiting and smoke comes out of my ears. Um, and then I'm like, wait, stop. Just enjoy the show. And I was like, okay, I'm enjoying the show. These are all recycled ideas. That's fine. And I have a list of them. The cage. The cage. Um. <laughs> wait, let me stop you. Uh, um. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on, everybody. Uh, 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 you know what it was? it was? It was Star Trek, the motion picture, when they go into the shuttlecraft and they, they tour the Orville on the captain's first visit to the ship. Mm. Yes, yes. That's Star Trek, the motion picture. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, oh, a space ray that speeds up time. Uh, and and, and, and uh, the episode when Star Trek, d d d the, the next generation characters get on board a runabout for the one and only time. And, and they encounter pockets of space that time accelerates or slows down when Deanna Troy freezes. <laughs> and then Captain Picard goes to grab all the rotten fruit and his fingernails grow real long. Yeah. And then they're like, whoa, like, okay, recycle ideas. But then, that, I mean, that one's fine. <laughs> and then we have the space zoo when uh, uh, Commander Ed Mercer, Captain Ed Mercer and, and his first Kelly officer. Grayson. They end up in the space zoo, which is the cage. The menagerie it, also. The, uh, well, the menagerie, um, uh, uh, the most toys, you know, like data and, and examples of different species, blah, 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 blah. And then I think the biggest one, the one that's just like, uh, uh, was the, the, big, the big eco ship, right? That was lifted directly from the original series. 
right. Directly. It, the episode is called For the World is Hollow and I Have Touched the Sky, where there's an asteroid. There's an ecosystem inside the asteroid, and nobody knows they're not on a planet, and they're hurtling towards doom. Uh, I mean, and then, of course, you and have... And the powers that be are trying to keep the people from even realizing they're on a ship. Then learn what it means to be our enemy before you learn what it means to be our friend. First guardian of the word of Doral, he makes all law. You are living inside a hollow ball. Your entire world is a massive bio-vessel adrift in space, and in less than six months, it's going to be sucked into the gravity well of a star. Because a flaw developed in the controls, and unless we correct it, Yonada will kill millions of people and destroy a world it doesn't even know. This is what we wanted you to see. Damage records indicate the engine failure is quite rectifiable. Guidance controls taking over. I believe we can allow the ship to go back to its automatic control. Yes, and, and then same with the concept of a culture uh, evolving from some like bullshit, like like the the book about Chicago gangsters, or or the most fucked up TOS episode ever, when a Starfleet admiral is on a planet, and he thinks that the Nazis had a really good efficient <laughs> system. You and I know that all those episodes in the original series exist is because they had costumes from another show and sets. We got, we got all these props from the Untouchables. Uh, let's have an episode that takes place on a gangster planet. We got all these leftover Nazi uniforms from that World War II picture they're shooting down on Lot B. Uh, this guy wants to have a Nazi planet. We got this haunted house set. Let's make cat's paw. There's a giant cat. <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, you're like, but but that was that was uh, all those episodes are iconic and memorable. Did I talk about the Dyson sphere? You did not talk about the Dyson sphere. The Dyson sphere, a giant, giant intergalactical spaceship. I mean, it has a sun in the center. It's a uh, little bigger. That's a little a, different. An ecosystem on on the core. There's um there, there's like the, the 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 Star Trek Voyager episode where the species eight four seven two are living in that dome that rep <laughs> represents they're they're basically training to infiltrate Starfleet. Uh, I I can't differentiate episodes on Discovery with with the exception of maybe the the uh, lifted also lifted storyline of the ship blowing up over and over again. But um, yeah, the, the uh, with the twist, Harry Mudd. Time and consequences, or what was that called? The TNG the episode. TNG, it was called um, uh, uh, Cause and Effect. Cause and Effect, that was it. Yeah. Core shutdown is unsuccessful. All hands abandon ship! Repeat! All hands abandon! Um, where, where, but that was a, like a technical glitch. Oh no, it was Kelsey Grammer flying through it was flying through some kind of time anomaly, and whenever they crash, time reset. But that that pops out as a standalone episode. So does sort of the one where uh, Sarek is is he gets uh, attacked. He's injured by, a, by a, the the yeah. Vulcan terrorist. Vulcan renegade, um, and and he has to use his mind to talk to um, Michael Burnham and like come save me and all that. That that felt a little bit like Trek. But then there's the the overreaching, overarching plot line of. Lorca, bad captain, mm -hmm. uh, and the tardigrade, the monster, the space monster, um, uh, which was reminiscent of uh, Voyager's Equinox parts one and two, when they take they, they take happy happy space eels from another dimension, and they suck the life force out of them to make their ships go faster, and then Captain Jane was no no no, no no no, that's wrong. You're bad, that's wrong. We traveled over 10,000 light years in less than two weeks. We'd found our salvation. How could we ignore it? By adhering to the oath you took as Starfleet officers to seek out life, not destroy it. Um, I think that, I think, I, I wanna say, I think in Dune, there is a floating monster that allows them to instantly transport from one side of the galaxy to another. In Dune, I'm not familiar in with Dune. Dune. Dune is a nightmare. <laughs> it's it's a nightmare of a film, but I, I think that happened in it. Okay. 
Soon they'll begin to fold space. Far off in the control rooms of spice gas. Traveling without moving. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that they stole ideas. I mean, ideas come from other ideas. Come oh, sure, Every, sure. Everything's connected, especially with Star Trek. There's such a history of Star Trek. There's so many, so many things happening. Fucking 60 years. Which is why when I watch uh, uh, The Orville, and, the, and the, I think one of the more recent episodes I watched with The Orville, it starts off with their android, Isaac. Yeah. Who I assume is named after Isaac Asimov. Or Newton. I thought Newton, but Isaac, it's probably it's probably Asimov. Asimov wrote I Robot. Because he did science fiction, yeah, right? Yeah. Right. So and it, it doesn't matter. They're watching Seinfeld, and then you know there's the joke on Seinfeld about them dropping a ju junior mint into the pit person in the operating theater. Yeah. And uh, the robot's like, "What is humor?" And then well, humor's funny. It's, it's it's funny. I don't understand the concept of humor. I'm like, I've seen all this shit before with data. I'm an android. Well then, have you seen any good looking computers lately? That's a joke. It's funny. Oh, of course it is. <laughs> guy walks into the doctor's office. The doctor tells him you need an operation. The guy says, I want a second opinion. The doctor says, okay, you're ugly too, but boom boom. People watching the Orville are probably like, hey, this, this, this is great television. I'm like, this is all recycled ideas. It's all recycled ideas put in different forms. Yes. So are we supposed to care about, about what exactly? There, there, there was one joke that I laughed out loud in, right? The one where Charlize Theron guest stars as Vosh, the female love interest of the captain who's secretly up to no good. I've seen that before. She's, she's up to some time travel theft, much like Max Hedrum in the next generation, his episode? Yep, yep. Where I come from, every historian knows the bridge of old 1701D. He's going, he's from the past, and he's going to the next gen time to steal technology. Why have you stolen these objects? To put in a museum? Oh, far too valuable for that. You see, in the century I come from, they haven't even been invented yet. She was from the future to steal ancient technology to sell in the future right. as relics. Yes. Um, so yeah, again, my brain is smoking from all I the I know references. you are. I've never seen you like this. Well, it's, it's, it's infuriating because I'm watching it and uh, even the Bordis episode, with like that, that was the first one where they tried a next gen one, where it's blatantly like, uh, like just they, the jokes disappeared that episode. Yeah, yes, yes, they didn't even try anymore. Bordis and his male uh, partner have a kid, and it's a girl, and there's the moral dilemma because their culture, they uh, sex change. Uh, yeah. Girls are like one in a million, and yeah. when they're born, they're, con they're considered like a, a freak, and yeah. so they change them because they have an all male society and they lay eggs. And so humans are, of course, we're like, you're going to change the sex of the baby without letting it decide. And it's like the wharf, uh, wharf spinal cord, you know, I want to die. Or uh, Half-Life, um, where Lwaxana Troy falls in love with, with the old man, and he's going to turn 60. And, and their culture's like, you got to kill yourself. Oh. Once you turn 60, it's like, I have so much scientific work to finish. When a person on this benighted little planet reaches the age of 60, which Timothy is about to do. They're expected to simply kill themselves. Did you know that? Hey, just kill yourself. And she's like, why does he have to kill himself? I was, thinking, I was thinking the Outcast episode. Well, that too. Where, where uh, Commander Riker fell in love with the, the gender the, neutral the person. The genderless person. Yeah. Who identified as being female, but the society was upset with that because they weren't supposed to have genders. And so there was a trial where they forced her to not be a female. Take Soren to quarters. Treatment will begin tomorrow. Don't do this. Soren! It's that episode. It's, okay. just, it's just that episode. 
Um, and Only then, it's not a baby, it's an adult. Recycled ideas, in all caps, bold print, yeah. underlined, that's fine. But then you have like characters that are like, like Ed Mercer, the captain, and you're like, eh, and, and he's like, I laughed at one point, like Star Trek can have humor, mm -hmm. right? It, it needs to be mostly serious with little spikes of humor. And when they were gonna sneak into Charlize Theron's room to, to snoop around, and then uh, Kelly Grayson, the first officer, she's like, I'm a first officer, you know, I, I, I do this by authority and, and respect and, and I don't mess around. Hard cut to her hitting the thing, yeah. she goes, housekeeping, and I, I giggled. Yeah. It's cute, yeah. it's cute in context, but then it's like, it feels like it needs to say, they need to say, well, that, that guy's a dick. Like, isn't it funny that they're saying well, dick? Like, a lot of the humor in the show, it feels so consciously tacked on. Because Seth MacFarlane, this is his Star Trek fanfic, and they make an episode and then it's, I, I get a feeling it's like, oh shit, that's right, I sold this to Fox as a comedy. Uh, insert joke, insert joke, insert joke. Because yeah. none of them, they all feel out of place and tacked on. And that's why it's, it does give you that warm, fuzzy feeling of a TNG episode. You know, it cuts to the opening, the ship's flying by, and then some inane thing before the main plot happens, and then, you know, it is same exact structure as a TNG episode, one and done, everyone's, everyone's back to where they started at the beginning, and you're watching it, and to me, it's like, it's, when, when I was watching it, I decided, I made the conscious decision, I can't watch anymore, because it's like, it's like looking at a picture of your favorite meal. <laughs> You know what I mean? You know what I mean? It's like, oh, you know, that's great. But I can only look at the picture of it. I, I can't taste it and I can't eat it. See, I, I contrast that to Star Trek Discovery where like I ordered uh, chicken parmesan and the waiter brings me a Salisbury steak. Discovery, like like there have been people that have said, you're shitting on the legacy of Star Trek, right? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. The, how did this take place 10 years before Kirk and Spock? People say that stuff, Yeah, right? I know they do. I... And I know you want just story and you want nice episodes and all that, but you're talking 50, 60 years of Star Trek. Mm -hmm. People say, how does this happen before Kirk and Spock? Because they want to know that all their characters and all their storylines are okay, <laughs> that they're intact. Somewhere out there is Picard uh, drinking, drinking wine on the Chateau Picard uh, in retirement. Riker's flying around with Troy on, on the USS Titan. Data's, Data's in pieces floating in space. Uh, you know, everyone's, everyone's, <laughs> and all, and all of their stories and happened. adventures happened. Even if even if it doesn't matter, and you could say, well, they happened, yeah, they're all on, on Blu-ray and you can go watch them. Go watch them, they're still there, but we're doing this thing now. But, but it's that mindset where they say, we wanna know that they happened. And when Discovery comes around and says, this is 10 years before Kirk and Spock, before like the terrible buttons and knobs, <laughs> And and, <laughs> and and people are like, no, we just don't believe that. We just think you don't care. Let's give them a little taste of what the Discovery's capable of. The ending of the first half of season one was pretty exciting to me. I, I enjoyed it because it's like, they have this plan and they have to do 127 jumps to do this thing, and you know, it was exciting in a in a in a Star Wars way. Yeah. Star Trek Discovery is more Star Wars. Oh, I know. Than Star Wars it's, was. It's a space opera. The flat out, the confrontation between Michael Burnham at the sword fight. Yeah. With the Klingon Emperor. Yes. That's not. That's just straight up space opera. Star Trek Discovery is now Star Wars. <laughs> and Star Trek is the Orville. That Star Trek is the Orville. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm enjoying Discovery in a way that I would enjoy Star Wars. Mr. St Mr. Stamets is, is in, in, in the glass chamber and he's, he's ah, <laughs> and the, the Discovery's going <laughs> and I was like, you just see, yeah, all right, this takes place 10 years before Kirk and Spock. Hard to port, Jammer, Mr. Reese, lock on the bird of prey, targeting a guard.
Um, and then, and then, and then they end up, they end up in the mirror, probably the mirror, mirror universe. And then I'm like, oh. Mr. Saru, what am I looking at? I, I, I'm not quite sure. I'm unable to confirm our position using standard procedures. Captain Lorca, he's a secret asshole. He's a secret mirror, mirror bad guy. Captain, this can't be rushed. Now you listen to me, Mr. Stamets. They need us now. He tells a story about how he took a life, a lifeboat and escaped the starship and blew up his whole crew so they didn't suffer the indignity of being captured by the Klingons. I mean, what? He, he's, you, you're saying he's a, a mirror universe double agent? I don't he, know. They get into the mirror universe and Enterprise because towards the end, I think the last season, they have like a, a Constitution class ship that's yeah. flying around, and it's well, like it's a, a ship that in what, what episode? It's, the, of it's called the Defiant from the original series the, that vanished. Yes, yes, um, uh, the Tholian web yeah. episode, I believe, when when the Defiant vanishes um, and then Kirk's floating around the space in the <laughs> spacesuit, um, and then yeah, so that ends up in the end of Enterprise, and they're like, we got this badass spaceship. Weapons are online. Destroy them. <laughs> So they deal with the mirror universe there, and then they deal with it in Deep Space Nine a little. It's of course yeah. way in the future, and it's more played for yucks and comedy. This was a nostalgia trip. It's like, hey, you remember that mirror universe? Isn't it funny how all of our favorite characters are bad? Yeah. You know, and it, it takes it a little like wink, wink, a little lighter. Uh, there we get our first uh, gay kiss, actually, in Star Trek. Uh -oh. Discovery can't take credit for that. Between Evil Kira and, and Dax, and, um, and yeah, and, and she was like a, like a, like a sleazy sex, sex pervert. And Worf was like a moron who was in charge of, of everything. And I think it was heavily implied that uh, um, Chief O'Brien and the doctor were gay lovers because he kept calling them by like a nickname, like, like, like Honey Bear or, or Honey Pie or... <laughs> in fact, he might have us in sights right now, we wouldn't even know it. Don't start getting paranoid, Smiley. Even if the Regent has the cloaking device, chances are it isn't functional yet. I hope you're right. You know, Star Trek, Star Trek for all of its uh, uh, touting of, of progressivism and, and all that, really wasn't that progressive. It took. It took extreme baby steps. But it takes, it took, I give them credit for taking the steps, but yeah, they were, they, the women were just second class citizens in the original series. Yeah. Perhaps you can explain to her that any career she hopes for in Starfleet requires discipline and cooperation. Well, I'm sure that's what the lieutenant wants. She just didn't understand. Did you know, lass? I remember. I don't remember what episode it was, but but Kirk and Bones were talking about some female ensign, like, yeah, she'll be gone when she finds a man. Yeah. They yeah. always do. Well, there was the the one, I, I want to say it was the Lights of Zetar, where there, there's there's like a female officer and... I didn't think Mr. Scott would go for the brainy type. I don't think he's even noticed she has a brain. They had to put her in like the compression tank to like get get the, the badness out of her. <laughs> and the whole episode they kept call her, calling her the girl. Like the, the the girl can't stand that pressure, and um, well, how about how about turnabout intruder? Oh yeah, <laughs> where Kirk gets possessed by a woman, and because Kirk's possessed by a woman, she can't handle the Enterprise because yeah. you know she's a girl. You will obey my orders. You will be charged with mutiny. You will obey my orders, or oh. she's bitchy. <laughs> she's bitchy and, and erratic and emotional. Uh, but even normal Kirk, who's in the woman's body, is still useless because he's in a woman's body. Right. <laughs> so having any taint of womanless, womanness just makes you horribly incompetent yes. in the original series. And they fully admit that women were not allowed to be Star Starfleet captain. I never stopped you from going on with your space work. Your world of starship captains doesn't admit women. Yeah, yeah. And then 10 years ago, though, we had 25 female captains, apparently. But yeah, the, the, so the, the first gay kiss was in Deep Space Nine, technically. The first interracial kiss was in the original series. Yeah. But 
it was forced by an alien. Yeah. Um, so we, we have we have a, a white guy captain, uh -huh. uh, followed by white guy captain and white guy first officer. Then we're like, okay, enough with the white guys. We'll have a black guy in charge. Well, he can't be a captain. He's got to start off as a commander. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, then, and then the season five comes around, four or five. Uh, okay, you could be a captain, but it's just this little ship. And then we're gonna have a lady, but you can't be a black lady or a Latina or a Chinese lady. It's gotta be a white lady. So it's like it's like they're hedging their bets. They're like a little half measures. We're gonna have a lady, but uh, it's gonna be a white lady. Um, and then back to the white guy. Although they did have they did have some some people of color in uh, in Star Trek Four: The Voyage Home. Yellow alert. Shields up. Hell, reduce closing speed. They're like they're like black female captain, uh, Indian man captain. They threw some, but all their ships got powered powered down by the giant space sausage. <laughs> they did they did say fuck for the first time in Star Trek, I believe. That's edgy. It's pretty edgy. One that understands its role in this process and engages willingly. You guys, this is so f***ing cool. <laughs> so sorry. No, cadet. It is f***ing cool. Are, are you okay? I think I'm all right. <laughs> I wish that Discovery and the Orville could, could combine their forces, come together to produce a show called Star Trek. Was I funny? No. Discovery is just, it's very serious, very cinematic, very dark. Uh, I can't tell if it's, if it's underwritten or overwritten um, because a lot of times you're like, okay, that's all that happened in this episode. And then a lot of times you're like, what? They did that? So, and then, and then you have the, the Orville, which has the comfy, warm, feeling of a Star Trek oh, blanket, yeah. but at the same time, I can't take the characters seriously, and I it feels like rehashing of ideas. I think the Orville's got some good characters. I mean, they're okay. They're, they're fine characters. They just don't fit. It, you know what it is? It's, it's when I watch TNG, a lot of times my brain would long for like, like the way that, that real people would kind of respond to situations, which is why I gravitated towards characters like Barkley, mm -hmm. or um, I want to say that early on they, they tried out a character around the time the Borg showed up. Her name. I like, have that in my notes. That ensign who so, spills the coffee on Picard. So, so. <gasps> oh no! Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Captain. Oh, ensign Sonia Gomez. Gomez, Sonia Gomez, yeah. or some, something like that. Yeah. And she's like, I'm just so excited to be here. And yeah, she spills coffee on Picard. And and so you and then you have Crusher, and and Jordy and and a lot of them are just boring. So you're like, why why aren't some of these Star Trek characters in like the next gen? And why don't they say like these these funny lines here and there like they do in the Orville? Like normal people would respond uh -huh. to the situation like, oh Jesus Christ! And now this is happening, but but they're all very regimented, and it's because Starfleet is a military organization. Yeah, by the book, by the numbers. By they're very they they adhere to rules. It's a pseudo-military organization. Yeah. The Orville feels like... I like Star Trek, and wouldn't it be nice if me and my friends were hanging out in Star Trek? Yeah. It's fan fiction, essentially. Yeah. And it's not fun watching someone else's fan fiction. I like when, I like when TNG characters get quippy, you know? There's mm -hmm. the scene when Guinan gives Worf prune juice, you know? Mm -hmm. And he's just like, what is this? This is excellent. You see, it's an earth drink, prune juice. Warriors drink. You know, and then we all chuckle, but then you move on from that. And you don't dwell on it and no one goes, hey, dickwad, you know, my balls itch. You know, like that kind of stuff doesn't, doesn't fit in there. And so it's like, it's like, oh, it's frustrating. How do you, on the opposite end though, how do you feel about the Star Trek Discovery characters? I get, I get nothing out of most of those characters. Michael Burnham's a mope. Uh, the captain, he's, he's, he's kind of interesting, but he's also an asshole. 
uh, Lieutenant Love interest is just a complete fucking waste of space. To, to Ash Tyler. Ash Tyler, Tyler Love interest, who's going to die before the series is over. Mark my words, because they've spent no time actually developing an actual character for him. Well, he, see, that's the thing, though, is like, like long form TV drama, there's a lot of things that you don't know. Here's Quark. He's 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 the witty bartender. He's a little shady, uh, but in the end, he does the right thing. Yeah. You know, here's Odo. He's 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 an asshole. You have your characters, and they're 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 solid, and and they're set up. Discovery. A lot of them are are yet to be determined or mysterious, which can be frustrating, in the short term. Uh, Ash, Ash Tyler mysteriously appeared on the Klingon ship with with Lorca and yeah. Harry Mudd, and and then he has these weird flashbacks about him possibly being raped yeah. by the female Klingon. And he's he's traumatized. He has PTSD or whatever. Um, is is he a Klingon spy? Is he a secret Klingon in disguise? He's a Manchurian candidate. Right. So and then Lorca, he's very very belligerent uh, and hostile and and warlike, which is odd. Yeah. It goes against all of the Starfleet training. Um, so that's why you know it's like, what is he a secret a secret bad guy? Is our captain a secret bad guy? We don't know all the answers. Is and, it? and I think, I think, I watched the one and done Orville's, and I'm like, that's cute. But that reminds me of six Star Trek episodes I've seen already, uh -huh. um, and I laugh a couple times. Discovery is 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 violent and dark, but it's something that's new, and I don't know where they're going with it. I'm very excited to see what happens in the second half of this season if they go to Mirror Mirror Universe. And are we gonna dis are, are they gonna fix everything? Is it gonna be that they were already in the mirror universe in the start of it, and then now they flipped to the positive Federation side? Oh, is your theory that the universe we've been watching is the mirror universe? That would make total sense. That is that is the only idea that might salvage the discovery for me. Yeah, because I mean, <laughs> basically everyone's an asshole. And this is how like the, the, the fascist regime gets started. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a possibility. That's what I mean is like, is like a longer story arc. Oh, that would actually be a good twist. Don't get too excited, they're not gonna do that. I'm just saying, that would be a good twist. That would be. We start off in the mirror universe, we don't tell the fans. And, they, and half of them go, this sucks, everyone's so violent, and the captain's an asshole. But then it's like, they flip over, and then... <laughs> and then here comes a, a Constitution-class ship. <laughs> it says, Captain Christopher Pike of the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> that would be insane. What, basically what I'm saying is, I'm okay with being done with the one-and-done plot lines, and I'm okay with the long-form storytelling, because I've enjoyed many TV shows over the past few years that you cannot pluck an episode out of the middle and just yeah. watch it, you know? Yeah. I can list 25 shows, and that's the way TV is now. Um, and so I'm fine with that style, as long as it's well-written and, and good and exciting. And so far it is. But yes, they really have to hit it home <laughs> at the end of this season. <laughs> they've got to hit a home run and they've got to sell it to me a little more. I'm gonna tell you something. I have already canceled my CBS All Access. Which, I wasn't I wasn't interested enough at the halfway point to keep it going. Even even divorcing it from Star Trek currently, there's not enough for me to stick around. As just a generic serialized science fiction Star Warsy show in space. I don't know. I'm I'm okay with the characters so far. I I, I want them to have good conclusions, good arcs, and I want them to I want to see them developed more over time. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing is like when I said, here's Quark, he's our bartender, he's shady, but sure. he does the right thing. We know that right away. Not much room for growth. But when you have characters that 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 you're discovering, no pun intended, over, over a whole season and plus, I think that's all right. And I think it's different. Yeah. Um, so to me, it's like, yeah, Star Trek has forked in the road and it's like Ugh. and if i had to choose a path i'd have to go discovery just because i prefer star trek to be taking itself seriously than it than 
really bad attempts at humor and recycling plot lines because it just seems like it seems like a shame. It seems like a waste. And and interestingly enough, like people like Jonathan Frakes um, and others have worked on both yeah. shows. And Jonathan Frakes is like, eh, Discovery. It's darker. It's it's more it's more like the Abrams movies. And Orville, it's it's kind of like TNG, but it, they say dick in it. <laughs> he's he's just like I'm the guy. I'm a guy. And here's here's. Well, that's, that's I mean, highly that's a somewhat highly accurate statement. That could have been this whole video, just us saying those that those two sentences, <laughs> because that's what it is. <laughs> but it's incredibly frustrating. Well, you you put your lot in. If you had to choose, you'd go with Discovery. I would go with the Orville. I, I will point to the next gen season one. And, and that felt like there were some episodes that, that felt like the original series reject episodes that they sure. made with this cast. And sure. it, it didn't fit. And, and you know what, they, they tinkered with it in season two and they made it work. I, I'm holding out hope that the Orville can do some tinkering and season two will be an improvement. And I, I didn't hate season one. I like some of the characters, a lot of recycled Star Trek elements. I can deal with it. I, I, I think there's room to work with these characters and do something, find their own voice. There's room to do that. But the very, the very concept is flawed. The foundation is, is unsound. Do you know what I mean? You, you could say the same exact statement about Discovery that you just said, is that it needs to find its own voice and get into a groove. But when you have you cannot take a show where season one, where they make dick and fart jokes and kind of turn it into the next generation over a couple seasons because you're always going to go back and have dick and fart jokes. You know what I mean? <laughs> and both shows are, are off to season two. Both have been renewed. They, they found they renewed, their fan base. They renewed Discovery? Mm-hmm. If, if I hear that something crazy and exciting happened, I'll renew that CBS All Access. Okay. No, the, 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 just thinking about the Discovery episode where, you know, they have the plant, planet, mm. sentient plant, planet that wants to create harmony between the Klingons and the Federation. And so it, 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 it makes a beacon to bring Klingon ship because the plant planet, this benevolent, wise plant planet, wants to, to make peace between the two worlds. And Star Trek Discovery just, just spit in the face of, of just classic Star Trek ideals because the Federation didn't even consider it. Just like, the Klingons are coming, we have to blow them up! Get your torpedoes ready, the Klingons are coming! Fire. Made me die a little bit inside. What doesn't these days? <laughs> I think that's when I made the decision to cancel my CBS All Access subscription. Michael doing? Burnham was having a sword fight, and I'm like, why, why am I here? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Rich. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I too am, am, am torn, torn between two worlds. I don't know what to do. <laughs> I just don't know what to do. Mike, we'll, we'll do what old men do. We'll just rewatch our old stuff and, and complain about them kids and their new thing. And then just die. And then we'll just die. That's fine. <laughs> That's fair. That's the plan then. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs> <laughs>